I've been uh, in this uh, Congress uh, a couple of times, maybe not exactly in the same room, and it was always a great pleasure to meet with uh, economists in uh, this region of the world. Uh, I've been uh, going through the program of the conference and must say that I was quite impressed. And uh, I certainly believe that in 20 years, uh, ERF has done uh, an incredible uh, uh, progress and uh, congratulations for this, uh, for this achievement. Uh, so I thank the organizers for inviting me for this, to this event and I also thank them to have uh, chosen the uh, topic social justice for this event. This is uh, a topic which is not that common when we talk about uh, uh, development economics, uh, although it is certainly, as uh, Ahmed Galal was uh, reminding us, a topic which has been uh, quite central in uh, ERF for, for, for several years. Uh, before I get into the crux of the matter in my presentation, let me uh, take this opportunity to make uh, some advertisement, commercial advertisement. It turns out that uh, the three speakers in this uh, session are all authors of uh, chapters in a uh, forthcoming volume, the second volume of the Handbook of Income Distribution, uh, which uh, should be out uh, by the end of the year. And I hope that uh, with all three presentations, you'll have an idea about what to find in this uh, handbook and how exciting uh, and uh, how innovative this handbook uh, uh, will be. And then when the handbook will be, uh, will be out, please uh, run to buy it. It is certainly one of the best buys in the coming years. End of the commercial. Okay, let me get into my presentation. Because... Uh, my uh, eminent colleagues are more on the theoretical and the normative side of social justice. I decided that I would be on the positive and empirical and, as a matter of fact, on the factual side of uh, uh, this uh, uh, topic. And what I would like to talk about is this hypothesis which is around uh, something that we hear very often about uh, the fact that inequality seems to be increasing everywhere in the world. This is true definitely in developed countries, and I'll review that in just a moment, but it's also true in many developing countries. And uh, the view that many people have is that if we have a common uh, uh, phenomenon of this type, there must be common forces behind uh, this phenomenon, and there is only one possible culprit, which is globalization. So we have this view that uh, globalization is producing this big increase in inequality, and some people go one step further. They apply the well-known uh, factor price equalization theorem in uh, international trade theory to say what is going on is simply the beginning of the inequality between countries being replaced by inequality within countries. Now, I would like to see whether this uh, uh, statement, this hypothesis, has uh, any uh, uh, validity. And, uh, of course, prima facie, it doesn't. It doesn't because it is not true that inequality is increasing absolutely everywhere. There are uh, countries in the world where, as a matter of fact, inequality is decreasing, and this is Latin America for the last 10 years. There are countries where inequality is very stable, and this is more or less the case of uh, countries in this region of the world. So we cannot say that uniformly, uh, universally there is this big increase in inequality. But at the same time, does it mean that the common forces of globalization are not there? There are many ways we can interpret that. Maybe globalization doesn't have the same impact in different countries. And this is something that we have to analyze. Maybe globalization forces are being counteracted, countervailed by idiosyncratic factors or idiosyncratic policies which, at least for a while, will prevent inequality to rise. And the third uh, hypothesis, the some third idea that I would like to develop is also the fact that maybe, maybe what we're observing, what we're measuring is not the right thing. 
And maybe we have a problem of logical consistency when we discuss uh, inequality in particular in developing countries, focusing on Gini coefficients uh, or other inequality measures that come from household surveys. And this will be uh, where I will put the emphasis of this presentation. So let me go on if I'm able to manipulate. No, I'm not. Yes. Uh, this is the outline. I will start simply with a very quick tour d'horizon of inequality changes around the world. Then a few words about common forces, idiosyncratic factors, and emphasizing this issue of measurement error, and then some concluding uh, uh, points. Tour d'horizon, first crucial data warning. It is difficult to make comparison across countries because inequality is not always measured in the same way. It is even difficult in many cases to do comparison over time. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, income distribution data are not fully comparable. And uh, some serious improvement have taken place in developed countries over the recent past. And we'll see again example of that. Yet things are still very far from being perfect. Considerable progress has been made in developing countries, in particular in uh, uh, the countries of this region. I call them MENA because my uh, World Bank past is uh, uh, coming back when I'm talking about uh, uh, these things. Uh, but uh, for the moment, uh, we have to realize that uh, we are uh, working with data which are uh, somewhat imprecise. Let's go over the evidence that we have about the evolution of inequality in developed countries. I will be looking at three types of evidence. The first one are standard Gini coefficients are, as they are reported by the OECD, which is collecting data and making them uh, completely comparable or, uh, and homogeneous. Second, uh, something about a new database which is becoming more and more important, which is call, called the top income database, which is based on tax data and uh, is used to look at what is going on at the very top of the distribution. This has been put together by Tony Atkinson and uh, Thomas Piketty and lately by, uh, joined by Facundo Alvaredo. And finally, I want to look at the evolution of the GDP share of labor or, uh, uh, the complement uh, of capital, because this also has some implication for what I want to say. Here are very well-known facts. This is the evolution of inequality, the Gini coefficient for equivalized uh, income, that is household income divided by the number of consumption units or adult equivalents in a household. You have the curve for the US, for the UK, for Canada. This is the Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, part uh, uh, of the data. And you see that in all those countries, including Canada, which has been for a long time a country with no change in inequality, we see that there is an increase in all those countries. When we look to continental Europe, Germany, Netherlands, again, an increase in both cases. And again, Netherlands is a, a country which is close to the Nordics and uh, where uh, inequality is uh, something which uh, uh, sounds uh, very badly. But let's go to the north and here is Sweden. Sweden which is really to some extent the champion of uh, 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 equality uh, in the world where again we see that over the last 20 years since the mid 80s until the late 2000s there's been an increase in Gini, which is quite substantial, from below 0.22 to uh, basically 0.25. This is not something which is uh, uh, negligible. This is not uh, in a country like Sweden. It is something which corresponds to a major change in the uh, way in which people compare uh, among themselves. Now, to show that things are not that homogeneous, here is a case of my own country, France, where to some extent the inequality has been going down for quite a long time, but around 1990 or the mid-1990s, the uh, process, the trend has been reversed, and over the last 10 years, there is definitely a small increase in inequality, but certainly there has been a change uh, in trend. So here we have a summary of uh, what is going on in uh, several OECD countries. 
this is a change in the Gini. On the right hand side, you have uh, increases. On the left hand side, you have uh, uh, falls in uh, uh, Gini. And you see that more than two thirds of the countries have seen an increase in the Gini, at least until between, in the 20 years between the 80s and the uh, 2000. Another piece of evidence is this one. This is directly taken from the top income database. This corresponds to the share of the top 5% uh, of taxpayers uh, in uh, the various countries. And we're looking at market income. This is before taxes and transfers. So this is not exactly the same kind of income that we were looking at with the Gini coefficients. And here you have historical data going back to the initial, the beginning of the um, 20th century. And you see that uh, definitely this is a U curve and uh, inequality in all those countries, the US, the UK, Japan, France, Sweden, uh, has increased quite a lot over the last uh, 20 to 25 years. And uh, if we look at the US, you see that in terms of that inequality measure, the US is back today where it was at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, here we see that this is completely consistent with what we have seen with the Gini coefficient. The only thing being that when you make a comparison between the data coming from the tax uh, records and the data coming from the household surveys, we can conclude that household surveys are underestimating the increase in inequality. And some people have worked on the correction uh, uh, which would uh, correspond to including the tax data in the uh, uh, with the household surveys, and the change would be much bigger than what we have seen in the previous slides. Finally, because top incomes are, uh, have a component of a capital income component which is much higher than the rest of the population, we may expect that their increase in, the share, in their shares will depend on the share of capital in, the, in GDP. And what we have on this chart is the evolution of the labor share of GDP, so the complement of capital income. This is the G8 or G7 countries. And uh, uh, you see that in all those countries, uh, except maybe uh, the UK, we have a very strong trend toward less and less uh, of GDP going to labor. And again, this is completely consistent with all the information that we had before. So the point. I want to uh, uh, insist upon to finish this presentation of the developed countries is the fact that basically what is going on is an increase in inequality which over the last 20 years is more concentrated at the top of the distribution and which, is, which probably has very much to do with the change in the functional uh, distribution of income. What do we get when we look at uh, developing countries? Now, we don't have data of the same quality, but I will try to uh, look at the same kind of uh, evidence. First, Gini coefficients coming from uh, household surveys. I will be using the uh, database of the World Bank, the POVCalNet uh, database. Uh, then, share of 1% income for a few countries in, uh, before tax and transfers. And finally, something about the uh, share of labor in GDP. Uh, very quickly, the various regions of the world. Here you have for, again, since the mid-80s until the mid or end of the 2000s, you have the change in the Gini uh, for various uh, countries. We are here in uh, Asia, and we see that in many countries there is a massive increase in inequality. Bangladesh, China, India, more urban than rural, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, in all those countries, the increase in inequality is very uh, strong. Africa, uh, again, the data are certainly less um, reliable there than in uh, other parts of the developing world, yet we can see that in some cases there are undoubtedly uh, big changes taking place, and uh, these are the, uh, the, name, the countries with uh, <coughs> which are underlined with a red uh, line, and you have Côte d'Ivoire, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, Uganda, Zambia, and what is quite interesting is that in this list of countries, you have several countries which have done on the macroeconomic side rather well over the recent uh, past. Here is 
what is going on in Middle East countries and uh, North Africa. And this is a complete difference with what we have seen before. Here, it is a world of stability. Egypt, almost no change over those, uh, this 20-year uh, period. Uh, Iran, some uh, uh, drop. Jordan, some big uh, uh, um, uh, change in uh, the uh, beginning of the 90s, but other, uh, except for that, no change. Morocco, no change. Tunisia, almost no change. Turkey, uh, which I put with this uh, group, a small uh, drop at the end of the period. But what is interesting here that we see that in comparison with the other countries, there is much less action, much less changes taking place, despite the fact that in all those countries, during this period, yes, something has been going on at the macro level, and it is very surprising to see that there is no reaction at the, at the income distribution level. And here is Latin America, where we have big changes taking place. In many countries, you have a U, an inverted U, which is inequality increased enormously during the 80s and the early 90s, and then inequality went down in the 2000s. This is a case of uh, Argentina, this is a case of uh, Bolivia, this is a case of uh, Colombia, of uh, Mexico, and uh, uh, it is uh, the proof that certainly, even when we look at household surveys, uh, it is possible to see changes taking place. Now, what is the significance of those changes is another story. This is the same kind of uh, uh, data, I mean, the people responsible for the top income database, and in particular, uh, Facundo Alvaredo, is collecting tax data in all possible countries in the world. This is not an easy task when you do that in developing countries, but he managed. Uh, recently, he got uh, the data for Colombia. Uh, today, he's working on data on uh, Brazil. So hopefully, within a couple of uh, years, we will have a database which will be more uh, rich. Here, we can see simply that in many developing countries over the recent past, we have the same increase in the share of the very rich people among taxpayers. India, China, uh, South Africa, um, even a small country like Mauritius, Argentina, in all those countries we observe the same phenomenon that rich people are definitely getting richer. And finally, the uh, labor share. In a developing country, of course, looking at GDP, the share of labor and GDP, is not something which is uh, satisfactory because only one part of the labor force is uh, salaried. So uh, it is much more uh, significant to look at the share of labor in uh, corporations because there we know that uh, the system is that uh, what is not going to the workers is going to the um, uh, owners. Uh, and uh, we have a better uh, sense of the evolution of the uh, way in which uh, uh, total value added is being uh, shared. And here again, you see that in many developing countries, we have the drop that we observed in developed countries. China, uh, Mexico, uh, India, uh, three big countries where we have the same kind of uh, uh, drop. I put here a couple of countries for which we have data uh, in uh, the region, Morocco, where we have the, kind of, the same kind of decline, Tunisia, where you had the same kind of decline except for the last two years, but I'm not completely clear about uh, the validity and what is going on in those uh, two years, which of course are being uh, very much influenced but, uh, by the events in uh, Tunisia. And in Egypt, where I must say that I'm a little uh, uh, worried by the very low level of uh, the labor share, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, requires to go uh, to see exactly what is in the national accounts. Those data are coming from the UN data on national accounts. Uh, not all countries are uh, there, but uh, it, is, it is worth really trying to see exactly what is behind that. So, the lesson from the Tour d'Horizon is high income countries, strong common and coalizing trend, and a very consistent set of evidence about the fact that the top incomes are gaining, and this is linked to capital income. Middle and low income countries, no clear common trend, uh, but we observe an un unequalizing trend among Asian globalizers, uh, many African countries, and in Latin America, and still at least until 2000. 
a clear trend reversal in Latin America in the 2000s and surprising relative stability in MENA. The key question is why the common and equalizing forces that seem to be present and strong in developed countries do not produce the same effect in most developing countries or emerging countries. Or is it the case that uh, the effects are completely different or that there are counteracting uh, factors? This is what uh, I would like to analyze now. But I guess that how much time do I have left? I have five minutes left. So in five minutes, I will not, have, uh, I will not be able to, 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 to do that. So let me... Uh, you give me ten. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so let's move. Uh, so, quickly, common factors are globalization forces. There are many uh, uh, papers, many books which have been written on the relationship between globalization and uh, uh, inequality, so I will not insist very much on this. Uh, I have a table, I have a slide where there is a table where I'm trying to show what kind of uh, 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 globalization, uh, what feature of the globalization may impact the uh, distribution. Uh, but on the other hand, we have to look at idiosyncratic factors. Uh, there are uh, country-specific exogenous changes in their economic environment. Um, we have uh, policies affecting uh, directly or indirectly the distribution of income and wealth. In many countries, this is interesting in the case of uh, developed countries, when we look at the origin of the change in inequality, it is not true that the increase in inequality is always due to the top incomes getting more income because capital income is uh, going up within uh, GDP. In many cases, you also have other policies. You have uh, 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 some uh, tax policies which are becoming less regressive in many countries. So in some cases, those policies are reinforcing globalization forces. In some other cases, those policies are countervailing globalization forces. And there is a big uh, analysis to be made country by country to some extent to try to identify what is due to globalization, what are the forces of globalization, and whether those forces or their effect can be seen in the data, or whether uh, they have been counteracted by some other uh, 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 factors or policies. This is essentially country-specific uh, work. Uh, there are not very much of this uh, being done for the moment, but I believe that if we want to understand better uh, changes in uh, inequality, we have to get into that. But the point, this is a table I was referring to, but I, will, uh, I don't have time to, to get to, to it. What I would like to do is to insist on the issue of the data and the possibility that at least in developing countries, we are facing development, uh, uh, serious measurement errors. Uh, we have seen that in developed countries, the inequality change is very much due to the top. The uh, problem in developing countries, and also to some extent in developed countries, but much less, is that the top is not very well observed. And when I'm saying not very well, as a matter of fact, in some cases the top is not observed in those data. When you have a household survey and uh, you look at uh, who is answering uh, the survey, you look at the richest people in the survey, um, somebody, uh, uh, Miguel Sekeli, uh, several years ago in Latin America was saying, it's quite amazing to see that the richest people in Mexico have uh, the income of, uh, of a top engineer. When we know that many people have an income much, much above uh, the top engineer. So basically those people are not there. So if this is the case, then we have a problem because what we're observing is not necessarily truly uh, uh, inequality. So um, we may be missing the rise of inequality. It is not completely impossible that in many countries actually there is an increase in inequality but we don't see it because we don't have the data to look at it. And uh, if this is the case, then definitely we should uh, be uh, careful in, uh, uh, in doing that. To show you the kind of uh, difficulty that we have with the data, here is a case I took in a, a database called All the Genies, which has been put together by Branko Milanovic. 
the data for Egypt to see what uh, uh, was the degree of consistency or inconsistency of those data. So you have data coming from wider for the uh, uh, past uh, years, and in the recent past you have data coming from POFCAL, the World Bank uh, database, and another World Bank database called the World Income Distribution Data, WYD, which, is, which has been put together by another team within the World Bank, and you have on the one hand uh, inequality decreasing when the other one shows inequality increasing, and for the only year where they have the same, uh, where they're publishing data, fortunately they coincide, but there is something which is definitely unsatisfactory in releasing this kind of data. Moreover, we have to take into account that in both cases they don't look at the uh, top of the distribution. So let me conclude with a couple of recommendations and suggestions. The recommendation is caution with the lamppost. This story about looking at inequalities through household survey genies, to look at uh, the impact of globalization, etc., is very much like the story of the guy who is looking for his keys uh, under the lamppost because this is where light is. Uh, when he knows very well that uh, he lost his keys uh, somewhere else. Maybe we are exactly doing that. Maybe we are focusing on uh, household survey inequality when the action is somewhere else. And this is the uh, point on which I would like to call your attention. So we have a disparate need for better data. It is absolutely necessary to uh, encourage and to push the initiative of the top income people and to uh, facilitate to them and uh, maybe here in uh, Egypt with uh, people who have been uh, at a very high responsibility in the Ministry of Finance, it would be a good thing if uh, it were possible to open uh, this kind of data to researchers. How to improve surveys and in many cases trying to combine surveys and the tax records as it is done in many developed countries. The top income correction may be absolutely severe. Uh, Alvaredo has a short paper uh, in Economic Letters where he shows the kind of change that you can make with a few percentage points going to the top 1% uh, 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 of the distribution. It is amazing and a small change in that proportion is of course producing big changes in the corrected Gini coefficient. The data coming from household surveys are probably correct to analyze poverty. They are probably incorrect to analyze inequality. And uh, this is for inequality that maybe will be, we are looking for our keys under the uh, uh, lamppost, and the lamppost in that case is the light of household surveys. But the point I want to finish off is that it is not totally dark around the lamppost. We have other data than household surveys that we should be looking at more carefully. Uh, we may rely on some indicators telling us something about what is really uh, uh, being recorded in household surveys. So we could look at uh, uh, whether we have information on uh, uh, profits, we could look at uh, whether we have direct information on uh, corruption in a country and whether this, is a this has changed or not, but we could also try to more systematically analyze not only the genies coming from household surveys, but another battery of indicators. What is the ratio of the mean survey income with respect to national accounts? This is an old debate in the inequality data literature. Uh, by how much is uh, the surveys under-reporting uh, with respect to national accounts? There are big difficulties here because the definitions of uh, incomes or consumption are not exactly the same, but yet looking at the evolution or that ratio is telling us a lot of things. In many countries, when you look at this ratio, it is declining systematically over time. What is the meaning of that? What, is, what are the people, who are the people who are missing? So if we were to follow that information, I think we would have a little more uh, uh, insight about what is the meaning of the standard uh, genies. We should follow the labor shares not in GDP, but certainly non-financial corporations, which is an information that is available in many, many countries and which is telling us something about what is happening with capital income. We should look at the GDP share of household income in total national accounts. 
uh, trying to see whether uh, when there is a big boom in uh, the rent of natural resources, how much of this is being uh, reflected or is being uh, uh, transferred to uh, households. With all this, I think that instead of uh, working more or less in the dark and interpreting uh, uh, inequality uh, coming from household surveys in a, a very uh, imprecise way, uh, we could add, add some, I believe, accuracy. I mean, of course, we'll never have something like a genie. We will never have the same kind of data that we may have now in some developed countries, but I think that uh, we would be able to make a big progress. So, in summary, this is a hugely important research priority, and I hope to have convinced some of you that this is uh, uh, research in which it is really worth uh, investing. Thank you very much. Thank you.